Diolch am y mynd o ni yng Nghanadledd Cenedlaethol Seren, dwi'n fel ag unrhyw gwyth, ewch yn bellach. Thank you for joining us in the Seren National Conference 2018, Above and Beyond, Dyma Session. This is Session, Gwyddorau Naturiol, Natural Sciences. Okay, so my name is David Willock. I'm going to talk about natural sciences for a bit, but I'm going to concentrate on chemistry because my own area is chemistry at the moment. Uh, so I work at the Cardiff Catalysis in Institute, which is part of the School of Chemistry at Cardiff University. So if you want to get more information about us, go on Cardiff University website, have a look around, uh, find a CCI, and you'll see the sort of research that I'm going to talk about. Okay. So I'm going to give you a brief introduction to where chemistry sits with the rest of natural science. Uh, and and then I'm going to launch into chemistry because then I'm, I feel a bit more comfortable in myself talking to you about chemistry. Okay. So you probably all think of science in terms of physics, chemistry and maths. Okay. So maths is obviously something that underpins everything. Um, at chemistry, in Cardiff, uh, we find in physical chemistry, people are usually a bit surprised at the amount of maths that we do. But in, in physical chemistry, you will need to do things like integration, differentiation, in chemistry, we balance equations a lot, so there's quite a bit of algebra. And there's some theoretical ideas in chemistry to do with quantum mechanics that we'll talk about a bit today, uh, and also to do with how molecules behave in mass, which is to do with statistics. So we do, we do a little bit of teaching of maths as part of chemistry. Uh, but really, maths as a subject is a kind of underpinning discipline for everybody. Physics um, is to do with energy and changes and to do with um, fundamental concepts in um, everything to do with matter, really. And chemistry is a specialization to do with how materials behave, how we can synthesize new materials, how we can uh, change the way we make things in order to make it more sustainable. So we have a problem at the moment that we're doing a lot of things based on fossil fuels, uh, and we'd like to get away from that. So chemists are working to using renewable resources, plant waste, et cetera. And a lot of the things to do with energy, to do with the use of new energy sources that we'll talk a bit about, are based on new materials developed by chemists. So chemistry is quite a practical subject, and it's around the materials that we use in every day. Okay. Chemistry underpins itself. So chemistry sits on top of things like bioscience, pharmacy, energy and fuels, materials and engineering, earth sciences and geology. So these bioscience areas are really the study of how the body uses chemistry or how organisms use chemistry to live and to convert food into energy, for example. So chemistry, an understanding of chemistry really helps if you want to go in later to study things like bioscience and pharmacy. If you're really interested in them now, obviously you can just do a degree in those. Now, what I'd like to do is just kick off for the first few minutes ask you to think about a few things that you've done today that have involved chemistry. Okay. So I'm going to take two minutes, which is quite a long time when you stood in front of a load of people, um, to ask you to think about that. And then you're going to shout it out at me and we'll discuss each little point in turn for about five minutes. That wasn't quite two minutes. I can never keep quiet for more than about a minute in front of a load of people. So who's thought of something that involved chemistry this morning? I heard quite a few people chatting about how much fun they had on the way down in the bus. Give me one example of chemistry that you've done this morning, or you've used a, a product of chemistry. Uh, driving down the bus. You, uh, why does that involve chemistry? Uh, the fuel that you use. Yeah, so the fuel that you use to drive in the bus is probably a hydrocarbon-based fuel. So it's been dug out of the ground somewhere. Has anyone ever seen crude oil? Yeah, what does it look like? It doesn't look like petrol, does it? Petrol is like a, a sort of liquid it's very it flows very easily crude oil is like a tar it's very heavy it's very black it's very viscous it's like treacle so if you try to use that in your car you wouldn't be able to push it through the pipes to go from the fuel tank to the engine so what chemists do is a process called cracking so cracking is breaking down long chain alkanes into smaller chains that lowers their viscosity allows them to flow and then you can put petrol in your fuel tank and allow it to go through um, into the engine and use it and drive here and listen to me talk to you about it. So that's a really good example of chemistry. And it's actually a good example of one of the things I, that I work in. I work in catalysis. Does anyone know what catalysis is? 
You probably all know what catalysis is, but you're too embarrassed to tell me. When we do a reaction like breaking an alkane down into smaller parts, we usually think of an energy barrier. So you've got this idea that the reactant part, the long chain alkane and the short chain alkane, the reason a long chain alkane doesn't just spontaneously go over to the short chain is there is a barrier. It takes energy. So you have to put in some energy. And what a catalyst does is it lowers the amount of energy that you need to put into the reaction to get from reactants to products. So it decreases the effort you have to use, the amount of heat usually in chemistry, to go from the long chain alkane to the short chain alkane. And most of the fuel that you've used to get drive here has been put through a catalyst. It's been put through a thing called a zeolite. The zeolite is very acidic, and you need very high acidities to break the chain apart into smaller bits. And that's what the alkane, how the alkane has been produced. You've probably also heard of fractional distillation of alkanes. So the usual thing is you think you've either got different boiling points, so you stick them in a massive column, you heat up the alkane, it melts, and then the, the lighter things go to the top of the column, the, heavy, the, light, the, the medium weight things go to the middle. That's a kind of gross cracking or separation. What the, what the zeolite does is it takes the long chain ones and it breaks them down into the small chain ones. So you can use more of the oil as petrol than you would have done otherwise. Because the long chain ones you would normally use for something else. Okay. Anyone got another example? One example. Yeah, so that's good. So cereal's a good one. So cereal, you, you probably had some sort of cocoa pops or something this morning. And probably the, the flavoring is being produced, usually at least altered artificially. People try and move away from artificial flavorings. But some of the very hard-hitting flavorings, particularly things like artificial sweeteners that people use, are produced by chemists. And that gets you into a whole range of things of flavorings and fragrances that we like to spray ourselves with. They're all produced by chemists. The other thing about the cereal, so I'm going to have three things here because I'm, I'm definitely feeling that I'm not going to get to five. Um, the, the other thing about cereal is it's a food crop. So it's being produced from wheat, okay, and other grains, corns. And those corns are being produced using fertilizers. Does anyone know a process that you require to produce a fertilizer? You've definitely studied this. Does anyone, anyone heard of the Harvard Bosch process? Yeah, so what does the Harvard Bosch process do? It's ammonia synthesis, yeah. So ammonia is made. It's a fixation of nitrogen from the air. Nitrogen in the air is a diatomic molecule. Two atoms of nitrogen join together. It's basically inert in the air. It's 70% of, of the air that you're breathing at the moment. What you want is ammonia, which is NH3. That's a much more reactive molecule. And from that, you can make nitrates. And nitrates are used as fertilizers. So it's a way of fixing nitrogen. And plants do this anyway. They take nitrogen from the air and they make their own fertilizer in the roots. But actually, that's a very slow process. And what we've done since the 1920s is speed that up with our own catalysis called the Harbour Bosch process. So catalysis produces about 70% of the nitrogen in your body, so your proteins contain nitrogen, as being made chemically in a massive industrial plant by ammonia synthesis. Okay. So you are all children of chemistry, essentially, or young adults of chemistry. Right. So, does anyone know where you get the hydrogen for that from? Because we, we make, we take nitrogen from the air, that's just ubiquitous, that's very easy. But where do we get the hydrogen from? Where would you like to get hydrogen from? Water. I'd like to get hydrogen from water as well. So everybody, even when you go to primary schools, they know hydrogen is H2O. <laughs> okay, so H2O, so you've got two hydrogens for every oxygen in water. And that would be a really good place to get hydrogen from, because it'd be really clean, because what you would make is H2 and oxygen. So you'd replenish oxygen in the air. But actually where we get hydrogen from is hydrocarbons. So methane is CH4, and higher alkanes all contain hydrogen. And there's another big process that goes on alongside Harbour Bosch, which is called syngas production. And it takes alkanes and it makes carbon monoxide and hydrogen as a side product. And that's the hydrogen that we sell and that we use for cereal production, for using as making nitrates so we can grow crops. That means that the crops that you eat are made using hydrocarbons dug out the ground that have been there for millions of years. So it's not just the problem with the hydrocarbon economy is not just that we drive around in cars and we need fuels. We also like to eat. And that requires us to fertilize the ground. 
and that requires the use of hydrocarbons that are also fossil fuel sources. Right? So there's a big problem in chemistry at the moment to try and move away from fossil fuels and start to use sustainable sources, plant waste. That also contains carbon and hydrogen. We'd like to source them from there. And water will be a fantastic source for hydrogen. But the energy you need to put in at the moment to break water apart is too much. It's too aggressive a reaction. It costs more energy to make the hydrogen than the energy we get back by using it. So what we need is a better catalyst. So people are currently researching catalysts to make it easier to break water apart and make hydrogen because then we could make our ammonia in a different way or we could drive our cars using the hydrogen. What would you generate, if you had a hydrogen car, what would you generate as a waste product? Water, that's right. Because you would combine the hydrogen with oxygen in the air <coughs> and that would make water and that would be a fine thing to emit from the back of a car. At the moment you emit lots of different things. So catalysis and chemistry in particular impinge on lots of different parts of our lives. And there's always challenges. There's always new things that we'd like to do in chemistry to make the world cleaner and more sustainable. And, and that's what I'm going to talk about today a little bit. OK, so we talked about hydrocarbons. This is the general formula for a linear hydrocarbon. The N is just how many carbons you've got. The H is hydrogens. So CN, 2N plus 2 hydrogens, because you need two CH3s at the ends. OK, what we normally do, if we can bus this, so when you were driving the bus here, the bus was basically undergoing combustion, using the expansion of the gases to drive the wheels. And that requires some oxygen, which is taken from the air. And that makes CO2, which is a thing that we don't want to emit because it's a greenhouse gas, and some water from the hydrogen. The side product of this is energy. It's not written on the scheme because I'm a chemist. And so I've left that energy off. That would be a physicist's job. OK. If you don't have enough oxygen around, and this is really common, if you don't have enough oxygen around, what happens is, you see there's less oxygen in that formula, so that's just n plus a half, that's n plus one times a half. So there's a lot less oxygen here. And then actually what you make is carbon monoxide. <coughs> Has everybody got a carbon monoxide detector in their houses? Hands up if you've got a kitchen with a carbon monoxide detector in it. A thing that beeps every now and again because the battery's low and it really annoys you, and then you change the battery or throw it away. Have you, got a, have you got a carbon monoxide detector next to your boiler in your house? Do you know? Have you got these things that lie around your house beeping every now and again? You have, great, okay. You, I'm sure you have, most people have, right? And if you haven't, go and get one. Because the problem with, with boilers, and the other thing is camping stoves. Does anyone go camping? Yeah, okay, right. So there's a real big problem in camping in that you use a gas burner. So when you cook your chips or whatever, well, probably not chips, probably boil something, make a cup of tea, you use a, a gas propane burner or something like that, yeah? Now, sometimes in Wales it rains when you're camping and you feel, I'd really like to get this camping stove and put it in a tent and we'll all be nice and dry and we can have our cup of tea. That's a very bad idea because what happens in a tent is you have less available oxygen than you would do if you're just outside in the field. Right? So it's very common for people to take with these things into, the, into a confined space and do combustion. And then you make carbon monoxide instead of carbon dioxide. And there's a problem with that because at 50 parts per million, carbon monoxide causes headaches. Do you know why that is? Okay, so in, in your, go on. That's right, so in your haemoglobin that carries oxygen around your body, there's an iron atom, and the iron atom usually spits, splits oxygen apart, carries an oxygen around your body, and gives you the energy to, to run and stuff like that. If you get carbon monoxide there, it's very good at binding to the iron. It's better than the oxygen. So the carbon monoxide takes the place of the oxygen, and it, it basically gums up all the, all the circuits of the system by stealing the site that would carry the oxygen around for you. So carbon monoxide is bad news. At 50 parts per million, we get headaches. Um, the problem is you only get a headache. Okay, so there could be other reasons that you get a headache. Then you get nauseous and you also get tired. So people tend to go to sleep and you think, oh, I've just had a bad day, I'll go to sleep. Problem is if you stay in the room with carbon monoxide, 700 parts per million get seizures. And what do you think the dot, 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 dot is? Death, that's right. I don't like to write death on a slide because sometimes people have a nervous disposition that give this talk to and I don't like to write death on there when we're all trying to be jolly. 
But anyway, yeah, above 700 parts per million, it's really dangerous. And so, um, and so we'd like to avoid situations where CO is emitted into the atmosphere. It is produced whenever you do combustion. You always produce a small amount of CO. The less oxygen you have, the worse it gets. So it's produced by car engines. Uh, and it's also um, produced when we make this hydrogen from the syngas. But that's a different story. Okay. And you can see this in satellites. So if any of you want to find out about chemistry in the world, go and have a look at the NASA website. Because NASA released all their data free of charge to anybody who wants it. Uh, and so that's a really good resource. And this is a plot from a thing called Moppet, which is one of the things that attracted me to this satellite. It's called Moppet. Uh, and it's a called a Terra satellite. And what that does is it looks at the Earth and it looks for the particular vibrational frequency of carbon monoxide. So we can tell molecules apart by their vibrational frequency because it's got a different mass to what you would normally find in the atmosphere. So we can tell that we've got CO and it's not just nitrogen or carbon dioxide, for example. And this is a map of where the carbon monoxide is on the planet at any particular time. These are two are April, and these, this is October. And the October one's the interesting one. When you read the website, it says that these two bits here, where, what area of the world is that? South America, but what that, what's that particular yellow lump on top of? It's on top of the Amazon rainforest, right? That's where people are clearing the Amazon rainforest and burning the trees that they're cutting down. And because it, you get incomplete combustion in forest fires, it produces CO. So you can see it on the satellite because you can see the CO being produced. And that is people burning bushfires in Africa just to heat their homes. So they're using incomplete combustion when they're heating homes as well. Okay. All this stuff is basically Northern Europe, North America, kind of R Russian and Europe parts of the world. Sorry, that's China, isn't it? The Chinese part of the world. All industrialized nations producing carbon monoxide and that's really just a, a label that they're also producing carbon dioxide because in combustion you would get a lot more carbon dioxide than carbon monoxide. So it's used, things like this, things like this spectroscopy of molecules is something you would study in chemistry and then it would allow you to interpret things like this and design satellites that go up and look at the world and work out what's happening to the atmosphere, work out if global warming is a real problem or not. So my particular research interest is catalysis, as I said at the beginning. So what we're trying to do is both uh, remediate pollution, so try and remove pollution from, the, from processes that we require, and also um, produce chemicals in a new, cleaner way that don't produce as much side products, don't produce as much waste. And that's really what chemistry does now. It's, people have a bad label for chemistry that they think the pollution is caused by the chemistry. The pollution is caused by the production of products that people want to use. If we can produce them in a new way, you can carry on living your lifestyle and you can still have the things you need but without polluting the world. Right, and that's a better way to look at it than think chemistry is the cause of the problem. Right, so one of the problems we have is that we drive around in cars, we, do, we, do, we produce carbon monoxide, as I just said, and what we'd like to do it, before it leaves the car is oxidise, produce, take CO, and make CO2. So this thing is in all the cars that we, we've driven around today. And I've got an example of one here. So this, this is a catalytic converter. So what I'm going to do is pass this round, but I do need this back. Okay, so when it gets to the back, just keep hold of it. Uh, so have a look at that. The reason I'm passing it around is if you look down the ch channels, it's got a really interesting effect. What, they, what the idea of this is, is it sticks in your exhaust pipe and the gases from the exhaust flow over this monolith. It's called a monolith because it's a single piece of ceramic material. If you tap it with a ring, can I just, just hold it up for me? Really high. Sounds like a teacup. Okay, so it's made of aluminium oxides. But what they do with those aluminium oxides is they coat them with platinum and palladium and also sometimes ruthenium. Uh, and what that will do is it will catalyze, it will lower the energy barrier we're taking the carbon monoxide, adding some oxygen, and making carbon dioxide, and then emit the carbon dioxide instead of the carbon monoxide. Okay. Can you see what temperatures that occurs at? So this, this graph is efficiency against temperature. So what temperature is that palladium starting its job at? 
When does it start oxidizing the CO2, the CO to CO2? So this is temperature along the bottom, and this is efficiency of oxidizing carbon monoxide. About 100 degrees, yeah, it's a little bit higher. That is 150 degrees, that little nick. So it's just around 150, okay? What, whereabouts in your car is there a temperature of 150 degrees C? The engine, yeah, the engine's the only bit that heats up that much. When you first get in your car, particularly this time of year, it's probably about five degrees C in your car, isn't it? Okay, and your entire car is cooled to that temperature. So when you first start the engine, this palladium, will be down here. It's got no activity for CO to CO2. And so the car emits carbon monoxide. So the current problem in car catalysts, these catalysts have been used easily 30 years, but they're still not effective at low temperature. They're still not working when you first turn your car on. Okay. And what we're trying to do is, is make them work at lower temperatures. It depends on which metal you use, what temperature it starts at. But this has to be designed so it sits really near the engine so as the engine heats up, the catalyst heats up, and then the catalyst starts working at high temperature. Okay. Right, so I've got to do this because I'm a chemist. What is this? <laughs> periodic table, that's right. So it's a periodic table. This is one of the most exciting things. In and in fact, I think the anniversary of the periodic table is coming up. So you're going to get loads of this because people are going to get excited about it. Okay. I've also made a mistake. Can anyone see a mistake on the slide? This is a really hard one. Okay, do you know what these brackets mean? The square brackets? Say again? That's noble gas core of carbon, yeah. And that should be 1s2. Okay, there's two electrons in the core state of carbon. And what I did was I was dashing this slide off. And I put hydrogen is 1s1, because hydrogen's got one electron. And I copied that to there. So I cut and paste it right down. So embarrassing. So when you read these slides, write a little two on your copy. I've not had a chance to edit it. But the, the important thing for chemistry is that this, the noble gas structure is the part of carbon that we can't access. Those two S electrons are so low in energy, they're no use to us. We only care about these four valence electrons, don't we? So carbon's got four valence electrons, nitrogen's got five, oxygen's got six. What the periodic table tells us is that carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen will make bonds in order to get to this end of the table. They'll try and pair up with other atoms and make eight electrons in their outer shell. Is that a familiar idea? Yeah, good. Okay, so whiz over this. So these are the kind of models that we come up with to explain chemical bonds. And what I'm going to talk about for the next 20 minutes is models in chemistry, the idea that there are different models for chemistry. Because I used to get really annoyed when I was at school, at school that um, the teacher would come in when we were at, in GCSEs and they'd say, this is the model to understand chemistry. Things bond with little dots that are called electrons um, and they pair up or they make eight shells. Okay? And then they came along at A level and they said, oh, sorry about that, that's wrong. The real model is this and they tell us a new model. Are you getting that? Yeah. What I've now realized, now that I've kind of got a bit older, is that there are lots of models in chemistry and really they've all got their uses. Okay? And all it means is that they're trying to treat you the easiest ones first and then build up the complexity. So today we're going to do that. We're going to build up the complexity really quick. Uh, and we're going to start off with the easiest model, which just says electrons are little dots and in bonds they get shared. Okay? So you can see that hydrogen likes to make one bond, carbon likes to make four bonds, because it's got this valency of four, and so it can take four hydrogens to make up its outer shell of eight. Okay. Models are really important. Models allow us to visualize what's happening on a molecular level in all these things like the CO oxidation chemistry. And that's what my job is in the Catalysis Center. I try and build models of what happens in chemical reactions. So we're going to look at some of those towards the end. And models have been really important. So things like DNA. This is Watson and Crick. I think that's the right way around. And they built this thing with Meccano, essentially, uh, of the double, how the double helix form. Okay. And that's how they, we know how DNA works, because they built a model, and the model tells you how the replication of the base pairs works. So once you've got the model, you know what's going on. Okay, right, I'm going to try and switch now and show you why that model of the dots is, is useful. 
So we said that we'd like to get hydrogen from water. This is water, H2O. And this is one way of splitting water. So in an acid solution, I can take a battery, like this one. At the anode, I can pull electrons off and pull the protons off water. So see they're H plus, they're not H. So that hydrogen has lost its electron. And where the electron has gone is into an electrical circuit. Those four electrons can go to the cathode and then it can take the hydrogen or the protons, give it the electrons back and make hydrogen gas. Okay? So splitting water electro electrolytically is, re is really easy conceptually, it takes a lot of energy. Okay, so I'm going to try and do this now. Right, so on here I've got three batteries. What type of batteries are they? Duracell, that's right. That's me getting myself focused. I've got three nine volt Duracell batteries, right? And all I've done is I've taken some of this drinking water they provided me with, I've put it in a little cylinder, and now I've put those three nine volt batteries together to make 24 volts, uh, and we're driving the electrolysis. So let's see if it's working. Okay, can you see the wire? Can you see the bubbles? Okay, so what's happening there is that's a hydrogen gas being produced at the cathode. Can you see the colour of the copper? Okay, so you can see quite a nice stream of hydrogen coming off. Okay, so we are working. Now down the bottom there, that's another wire. That's the anode. So what should be coming off the anode? Oxygen, that's right. Can you see much oxygen? Does it look as lively as the hydrogen? No, it doesn't, does it? So, why do you think that could be? I was actually surprised when I first did this. Why do you think there's less oxygen coming off than there is hydrogen? There is twice as much hydrogen, that's right. So, but it's, it looks a little bit worse now, doesn't it? Because the hydrogen's streaming off, and the, hydrogen, the oxygen's sort of making these little tiny bubbles that are very unconvincing right so there's a, there's something else going on what we'll do is i'll try and come back at the end and we'll look at it again and i'll try and explain what i think's happening to the oxygen okay Okay, now the other computer's refusing to talk to the slide as well. There we go. Does that come back on your screen? Thanks. Okay, so what we've done is we've made this battery split water apart and make hydrogen. Okay, and it's also made oxygen, but we don't quite know what's happened to the oxygen yet. Okay, but splitting water requires at least 1.23 volts electrochemically, and we've just used, had to use 24 to get a reasonable rate, to get a reasonable speed going. So it's, it's not that an efficient way. But the Lewis structures, the thing with the dots, do tell us that in each of these OH bonds, there are two electrons. And so when I split them apart, one goes with the oxygen and one goes to the battery. So if I split two waters, I'm breaking four bonds, I'm making four electrons. So that all works. So it's nice. But oxygen is a more interesting molecule than that. So this is a, a if you go on YouTube, this is a video I got off YouTube, or a, a still of a video. Uh, and what this is, is liquid oxygen. See that sort of water looking stuff. And it's in between the poles of a really strong magnet. So this is a north and south pole of a magnetic, one of those big magnets. Okay. What can you see happening to the oxygen? It's getting caught, isn't it? It's getting, it should just pour through because it's a liquid. So it just should just drip through. And if I did nitrogen, nitrogen would just pour through between the poles of the magnet. But what this tells me is oxygen is ma magnetic. It's paramagnetic. 
It's like a little magnet, the O2 molecule, and it gets caught in magnetic fields. I would have liked this to do this here, but liquid oxygen is a bit tricky to play with. It's certainly a bit tricky to carry from Cardiff to, to Paris and put here, and I'd, you'd be too close to, to do it. Okay. Um, but what this, I put this on for is because it shows you that Lewis stuff doesn't explain it. Okay, because there's no magnetism in the Lewis structures, they're just little dots. Okay. And what you need is another property of an electron, and the electrons in the oxygen have got a magnetic moment of their own. So an electron's like a little sphere, it's spinning around on an axis. Whenever charges move, you make magnetism. So electricity and magnetism are linked because moving charges make magnetic fields. So the electrons are no exception, they spin around. And so we say an electron can have a spin up or a spin down. Okay, so it can be spinning that way around or that way around. And what happens in nitrogen is that there's as many spinning up as there are spinning down. So there's no ma net magnetic moment. What happens in oxygen is there are two electrons per spur and they're the ones that give us the magnetism. And I want to show you why we know that. Okay. But it does involve talking about quantum mechanics. Has anyone thought about quantum mechanics in physics or anything like that? Good. Okay. You see, people are nodding. So in quantum mechanics, there, we, there used to be concepts of particles and waves. And what quantum mechanics says is, well, actually, whether you're a particle or a wave depends on how you look at the problem. So we've talked about electrons as little dots. But actually, electrons can be waves as well. So this is how you find that out. So this is a really classic experiment called a, a young slit experiment. So this is actually a trough of water, a really narrow trough of water. And on this end, there is a bar which is wobbling the water up and down and making waves. Okay, so you can see the waves here. The, the light bits are the high points in the wave. The dark bits are the low points on the wave. Okay, so the wave is coming forward. You can see they're all parallel to each other. The tops of the waves are all parallel to each other going that way. But then that black bit there is a barrier. It hits a barrier, and there's a hole there, and there's a hole there. So the wave hits. All these bits can't get through, so they just stop. But this little bit of wave can go through the barrier. Can you see that the gap there, that's the gap in the barrier, is about the same as the gap between the top and the two tops of the wave? Yeah? So if the barrier is about the same size as the wavelength, it doesn't just go straight through. The wave goes through and gets bent out into this, these sort of semicircles. You see that? Okay. And that's a property of a wave. That's called diffraction. Waves spread out. Particles should hit this and just go either go through or hit the wall and not go through. If I fired a particle this way, I would get a shadow of the, of the slit over here, wouldn't I? Because all that would happen is the ones that can get through go straight through. The ones that can't get through bounce back. So th this is one way to distinguish particles and waves. The other aspect of this is that as the waves go out, they hit each other. And can you see here, there's like a low point, there's a shadow, and here there's a wave. So here, the wave from this bit is a peak, and the wave from this bit is also a peak. So they reinforce each other, and you get a bigger wave. Along here, the peak from this bit it's a trough from this bit. So one's going up, one's coming down, and that just cancels out. And you get still water. So the water gets flat. And that's another property of a wave. Waves interfere with each other. So if I have one wave and another, if they arrive together, I get a big wave. If they arrive opposite each other, I get a cancellation. And so that's another way of telling waves apart. Okay. So people did this with electrons, and with photons for that matter, for light. And these are two experiments uh, using a thing called a cathode ray tube. Has anyone got a really old telly? Tellies used to be massive things called cathode ray tubes, in which at the back of the telly, you would have this. Back of here, there's a hot wire. And the hot wire gets put in an electric field. That rips electrons off it, fires the electrons down the tube. The tube's in a vacuum, and then it makes a picture on the front. And that could be EastEnders if you did the right thing in the tube. Right, so people used to watch these things, have them in the corner of the room, heating the room up. You've all now got nice flat LCD tellies. OK, 
okay? Much less power, much more environmentally friendly, a real step forward. But for understanding electron motion, these are really interesting because you can see if I have a large target, like this cross, it just makes a shadow of the cross on the front. So the particles either hit the target and get, get lost, or they go around the target and they make a shadow. So they were behaving like particles. Over here, there's another experiment. And again, there's another website. So this was done by the Hitachi company. And they made a young slit experiment for electrons. So they put the electrons through two slits. And then they looked on one of those screens uh, as the electrons arrived. And you can see very early on in the experiments, these little dots, they're individual electrons hitting the screen. So one electron at a time is banging into the screen. It makes a phosphor glow. glow. Okay, that's another bit of chemistry, actually. If you watch for a long time, it starts to build up a pattern. And you see this pattern here? So you get some areas where the electron reinforces and you get a bright line, and somewhere it doesn't reinforce and you get a dark line. So it looks like the interferences that we saw with the water. Does that make sense? Yeah. So on this experiment, the electrons are acting as waves. In this experiment, they're acting as particles. And one of the really crazy things about this experiment is that if you measure the rate at which the electrons go through the slits, there's only one electron ever in the experiment. So one electron goes through both slits, interferes with itself on the screen. Right. And that is just mad. That's what quantum mechanics does for you. There's no way of knowing which slit the electron went through. And on average, it goes half through each slit. And then it can perform an interference pattern on the, on the screen. Okay. So the point for us, though, is that electrons are waves. And so rather than these dots in the Lewis structures, we need to look at the waves. Okay. Now, the last thing I'm going to show you, which is not kind of chemically based, is this guitar, because I like this. So we've looked at the electrons in the tubes. So that's like an electron being free, like the water wave just traveling across the, the, the boat, the um, pond or wherever it was. These are waves that are confined. So electrons get confined on atoms. This is a wave confined on a guitar. So this is a guitar soundboard. And what someone's done in our physics department, actually, Bernard Richardson, he's shined a laser at this. And by looking at the laser interferometry, he's worked out the height and plotted a contour map as the board vibrates. So the reason that if you pluck a string on a guitar, it makes a loud noise is because the entire guitar is vibrating at the same frequency. So the, the guitar board amplifies the sound and lets you hear it. Okay. Um, this is a low frequency. Can you see it's kind of just all the guitar board is coming in and out at the same time? This is a, a double frequency nearly, just over double, 268 hertz. And now one side of the guitar gump comes out so this side of the guitar comes out, that side of the guitar goes in, and they wobble like that. And that's a higher frequency. Okay? So this is going against that. And then if you go a bit higher again, 730 hertz, these four regions all oscillating in different ways. Okay? So as these two come out, those two go in. And that's where the sound comes in a guitar. That's why a guitar sounds like a guitar, because whenever you make this frequency, you get these overtones at different levels. It makes a guitar noise. Okay. So what's that got to do with chemistry? What's that? Does anyone get reminded about chemistry when they look at that? Does anyone get any inkling about chemistry with that? Okay. Have you seen these ones before? Seen <coughs> S orbital, P orbital. Okay. These are the same things. This is an electron confined to a very small space because it has to be near an atom. So the electron sits on the atom. The lowest energy it can have is in the S electron. And that looks like a little sphere. The 2p orbital has got two lobes because it's like the two sides of the guitar. Okay, so these lobes are like the wave of the electron. One's coming in, one's going out. And that's how you can think about those. They're, they're waves. They're standing waves for the electrons. Okay. And what we do after the Lewis structures is we build up the bonding based on the waves not based on the particles. So this is my picture of hydrogen. Hydrogen is two s orbitals. So I've got a wave on one hydrogen atom with a one s electron. I've got a wave on the other hydrogen electron, on the other hydrogen atom. If I bring them together and those two peaks coincide, 
So I get both the same phase, they're both going up at the same time, I get a bond. And the electron spends a lot of time on both hydrogen atoms, and the energy is lower, this is energy on this diagram going up, the energy is lower than if it was on the atom. So the hydrogen forms a bond with another hydrogen atom because the energy goes down. If I make them so that the one wave is going up when the other wave is going down, the phases are different. Do you see the electrons disappeared from the middle of the bond? And that's going to push the two hydrogen nuclei apart. So that's called an anti-bond. And luckily, hydrogen only has two electrons. One spin up, so one with a magnetic moment up, one with a magnetic moment up on the other atom. When I put them together, one's up, one's down. So is that magnetic? Is hydrogen magnetic? Hands up if you think hydrogen is magnetic. Hands up if you think hydrogen is not magnetic. Well done. There's a few of you who have tentatively doing it. You're right. Be confident. You're correct. Hydrogen is not magnetic because it's got one spin down electron and one spin up electron. So the two magnetic moments cancel out. Let's look at oxygen again. Oxygen has got this. It's got 2s2, 2p4. It's got six electrons to share. It makes bonds with another oxygen atom. And what happens is it can use the s electrons a bit, but it actually uses the p electrons for the highest orbitals. So if you imagine two oxygen atoms on these two centers, there'd be two of these, so they make a bond, and two of those, so they make a bond. Okay. I'm going to whiz over this a little bit faster because I want to get back to catalysis. So there's two bonds made from the p orbitals, one from the pz, and one from the PY. Okay. So I can, you can imagine those two orbitals. What do you think the relative energy of those orbitals would be? Is there any difference between the PZ and the PY? Other than the way round they are. No, there's no difference, is there? It's not like the S and P. The S and P are different energies because the electrons are in different patterns around the nuclei. But those two P orbitals are the same. They're just turned by 90 degrees. Okay. So if I put two orbitals together, Where's that gone? In oxygen, what I get is I get two orbitals with the same energy. And then the electrons don't have to go into separate orbitals. They can just sit one in this orbital and one in this. And now I've got two spins. So I've got magnetism. Because the two electrons can sit one in the X, Z, one in the Y. And they can have their spins parallel. And that's what you need for paramagnetism. That's why the oxygen sticks in the magnet, because it's magnetic. But I that, you should get, if I look through the notes, if you're really interested, you can convince yourself that that's right. But I'd like to get back to some actual chemistry now, or what some people talk about as actual chemistry. I do actually spend my life looking at those sort of pictures and just working out orbitals and trying to get theoretical chemistry to explain real chemistry. So we're going to talk about real chemistry again now. So do you remember we want to get rid of carbon monoxide by oxidizing it to carbon dioxide? That's what we started off trying to do. Okay, so we're trying to do this reaction. And we said that a catalyst lowers the barrier to a reaction. So you have a barrier to making the carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide, and that barrier gets lowered because the catalyst is there. And what this slide shows you is how it does it. So what happens is it's not the same pathway between the CO and the CO2 that you would use in the gas phase. In the gas phase, you would have to break the O2 apart, make oxygen atoms, and then one of those atoms can go and react with the CO and make CO2. Does that sound right? Now, you've got to break that O2 bond because you're only, only going to transfer one oxygen atom to the carbon monoxide to make carbon dioxide. When you have a surface present or a catalyst, what happens is the CO and the oxygen both absorb. This ad ADS means adsorb. So they absorb on the surface of the catalyst. So you imagine you've got your plagium particle, and the oxygen absorbs on the plagium. And then when it breaks, it has some bonds, because it has bonds to the surface. So it's not as bad as breaking the oxygen in the gas phase and ripping that O2 molecule apart. You're breaking the O2 molecule apart, but you're making palladium oxygen bonds. So that's kind of a little bit easier. And what we found in Cardiff is that you can break the O2 bond and make oxygen atoms on the surface, then the CO will absorb, and then they bond together and make CO2, and the CO2 as a gas comes off. And so what that means is that the absorption site, where the CO absorbed and where the oxygen absorbed, 
can do another reaction. So the other thing about a catalyst is you don't need very much of it because molecules react with the catalyst, but the catalyst itself doesn't change. So the surface can do another reaction, get rid of some more CO. We've also found that gold is really good at this. So this is a, a plot of the efficiency of the gold catalyst as a function of the size of the metal particle. And that says nanometers. Okay. So anyone know how, how far apart atoms are in molecules? What the dis bond distance is for something like H2 or O2? We usually like to talk in, in uh, SI units, don't we? So you have like, this is nanometers, and it's still a particle of gold. So there's more than one gold atom in that 3.5 nanometers. So the next level down would be 0.3 nanometers, wouldn't it? And when you get down to about 0.1 nanometer, you're at what we used to call angstroms. Do people still learn angstroms? You ever heard of an angstrom? No, an angstrom is 10 to the minus 10 meters. So it's not a standard SI unit, so you tend not to use it anymore in schools. But it's very common. We'll talk about it a lot if you go to university to study chemistry. Because an angstrom is about the length of a CH bond in an alkane. So it's a very common unit for chemists to work with. 10 to the minus 10 meters. So it's 0.1 of a picometer. Or 0.1 of a nanometer, sorry. 0.1 of a nanometer is where you start getting chemical bonds. So 3.5 is about 10 gold atoms long. 10 gold atoms start doing this reaction. That's all you need to get the reaction going. And in fact, if it gets too big, it gets to 20 nanometers, that's a big particle. It's not reactive anymore because gold doesn't oxidize. So it's not, my ring doesn't oxidize. Okay, so let's see how that works. I'm gonna go on to the number of it. Okay, so these are the calculations now, using the same quantum mechanics that I've just talked about, the same wave functions showing you the S and the P orbitals. But now this is a catalyst particle. The yellow atoms are gold. The sort of pinky atoms or bluey atoms are iron, and the red atoms are oxygen. So what this is showing you is a model. It's just a model in a computer of 10 gold atoms with an oxygen molecule, and it's on top of an iron oxide. The reason it's on top of iron oxide is because that's what they use in the real catalyst in the lab. So we're trying to reproduce what happens in the lab. And what we're going to do is try and work out why those 10 gold atoms are more reactive than a, a big lump of gold. Uh, so hopefully, I can get a mouse up on here now. There it is. Click that. And what this is, is a movie of the oxygen molecule being broken up by the catalyst particle. So you can see that the, the yellow atoms, the red atoms, start off as a little O2 molecule, and then gradually we pull them apart, but all the time they're keeping in touch with the gold atoms, aren't they? They're always touching the gold atoms. So that's how catalysis works. We keep metal oxygen atoms in play while we break bonds we'd like to break. So the molecule falls apart because it's more stable to go and make oxygen as atoms on the surface because the metals keep hold of the oxygen atoms. Um, you can also see that gold atom there, you see it runs out and goes in between the two oxygen atoms. So that gold atom, do you know what process that will be called? So that gold atom becomes part of an oxygen lattice instead of just a gold lattice. It's mixing, it's making an oxide. It's become, ox it's oxidation, isn't it? So that gold atom is being oxidized. And what it's doing is it's taking the O2 molecule and it's, they, it gives some electron density to the oxygen and makes it kind of O2 minus thing. And then it becomes an oxidized gold atom instead of a metal gold atom. All these atoms are still metal gold atoms because okay, they're not bonded to the oxygen. So in small particles, what you can do is they're very malleable, they're very flexible. You can pull them apart and things like oxygen can take one atom out and start making oxide. Now what, that's what makes gold more reactive than other metal, other bulk gold. Small bits of gold are much more reactive. Okay, now having seen that, can you ever think about what happened to our experiment? Why the oxygen wasn't coming out? Because it's 
Yeah, so what it's doing is it's doing a similar thing to with the copper. So we're making oxygen in the cell. And what we're going to produce is not just copper, but copper oxide. So we're, we're, we're not just, we're not producing the gas because it's being made into a, a solid as copper oxide. So I think we might even be able to see that now. If, you, if we go back to the <coughs> microscope. Okay, so I left this connected up. Can you see that the oxygen is still coming off the white electrode? Okay, so can you see there's still gas coming off there, so there's still hydrogen coming off. That's the white electrode, which is the cathode. You see the gas going past? Yeah. So now I'm going to try and find the other electrode. That's quite difficult to focus on. And what we should see is the wire is in the bottom right hand corner. Yeah? What colour would you say that is now? It's kind of an orangey colour, isn't it? And that is, that is basically copper oxide because copper is a kind of goldy colour and the oxide is a red colour. So, what we've done while we've been chatting is I've made enough oxygen to oxidise the surface of those copper wires in the cell because I just left it running while we were chatting. I'm leaking hydrogen into the room, so we can't smoke. That's a joke. Okay.